So the first thing we can say about this budget is that it's large. All up, there's $62 billion worth of funds allocated for the coronavirus response. Of that, $42 billion has already been allocated to specific spending projects, and that represents about 14% of GDP. And that's a comparable figure to money spent by governments in Australia and the rest of the world. But on top of that, there's $20 billion that remain unallocated, i.e. that's spending that's ready to go, but hasn't been given to specific projects. And that provides a huge amount of flexibility um, within this budget to target those areas which might need help, which are yet unforeseen. All up, this is the policy of least regrets. There's lots of uncertainty at the moment and the government doesn't quite know how to respond. But what they have done is put up a big figure in terms of being able to support the economy going forward. So what is this budget designed to deliver? Well, its primary objective is absolutely to minimise the short-term economic fallout from this outbreak. And here the focus has been put on employment. So in the short term, we have the wage subsidy scheme and the assistance package for the tourism sector, which is the hardest hit. In the medium term, we have the creation of construction jobs via the 3 billion infrastructure package, the additional 6,000 public houses being built, and also the apprenticeship scheme and the environmental jobs to be created. This focus on employment is the best way to minimise the depth and the length of the recession that we're going to find ourselves in and put the economy in the best place to recover. What we don't have in this budget is any focus on how we will fund this stimulus package. There are still healthy spending packages for health, education and defence, so we haven't seen spending cuts in other areas. And there's no increases in tax to try and pay for this that would offset some of the stimulus to the economy that this budget is designed to provide. So it's large, but is it large enough? Well, on the government's own forecasts, the economy is set to shrink some 4.6% this financial year and a further 1% next financial year. So the hit to the economy from the coronavirus and the government's response is significant. The government's fiscal response package is in place to provide an offset to that lost GDP economic activity. The fiscal impulse, i.e. the spending by the government, as a percent of GDP is going to be 7.8% this year and next year. So it will go some way to bridging that gap. There's lots of uncertainty though, so we don't really know how much money we're going to need to spend, but remember the budget does have that extra 20 billion un unallocated, which can be used to plug any holes that might emerge going forward. As a comparison, you can look at the rebuild cost of the Canterbury earthquakes, which totaled around 50 billion. So this support package is in the order of magnitude similar to that. Ultimately though, we won't really know whether this budget is large enough until some 12 months or even longer down the line. And it will all depend on a multitude of factors such as employment, business and consumer confidence and how the economy fares. So what does this budget not deliver? Or what issues do we see? Well, the primary issue with any government spending package is whether it is effective, whether it delivers a stimulus that it's designed to, and if and when this money can get spent. This is more important with this budget than ever, given the size of the economic hole that this virus has created, the uncertainty that, that surrounding the economic situation that we're in, given it's so unprecedented, and also the short amount of time that the Treasury has had to put together this package. So the devil will really be in the detail here. For example, we will be able to find infrastructure projects that can be delivered quickly and suit the skill set of those that need employment. And when and how and on what will the health spend uh, be actually deployed? The other issue that we foresee with this budget is while we absolutely support the short-term focus and the focus on employment as the best way forward and the most immediate requirement, there is very little strategy and direct focus on the recovery. So we've heard a lot of rhetoric from the government about repositioning the New Zealand economy to, to be in a better place and have better growth going forward, but we don't see anything much targeted here. Instead, some of the more medium-term packages are focused around broader government objectives. 
and some of these may not be sustainable or may see money leaked offshore. For example, are environmental jobs the best ones to be creating to get the most bang for buck? And is rail investment going to see some investment in rolling stock that goes to offshore companies? The flexibility the additional 20 billion can provide, we hope to see some of this focused on those more medium term recovery goals if the economy is in a good enough position to do that. So the next question is, can we as a country afford this big stimulus package? Well, in order to fund it, the government is going to have to issue more government debt. And that's going to increase our net debt to GDP, which is a key figure that investors look at. So our net debt to GDP figure is going to rise to over 50% over the next few years as a result of this extraordinary stimulus package. Now that sounds like a high number, but we've been there before. In the late 1980s, New Zealand government um, debt to GDP peaked at around 50%. So it's not yet unprecedented. Also, if you compare to other countries around the world, they already have net debt to GDP figures in excess of 50% right this time now, never mind with the increased spending they're going to have to do to get through the crisis. Now with the government issuing lots of new debt, we need to make sure there are investors that were willing to buy that debt. And this is where the RBNZ's increased quantitative easing program has come into play. So this week they announced an increase in their QE program to 60 billion, and that will go a long way to supporting the government bond market and ensuring smooth functioning of that market and investors have confidence to buy the government debt that needs to be issued. In conclusion, yes, it does look like we can afford this package, but the key question and the key point is going to be, can we get bang for our buck? Our net debt to GDP levels are going to be elevated, and at some point we will need to be able to pay down that debt. It's better that we can stimulate the economy and improve growth, and therefore increase GDP and reduce the net debt to GDP levels organically without impairing future governments' ability to spend. The implications for the equity market in particular are a little mixed. The equity market staged a very strong recovery in April, and we think investors are looking relatively optimistically through the near-term economic volatility and into the recovery in a very low interest rate environment. This budget should deliver that recovery, or at least put the economy in a good place for the private sector to then go and deliver that recovery. But there's not a lot of detail, and some investors may be disappointed by the lack of direct support for the private sector and also for spending. However, what this does do is put the New Zealand economy in a good place relative to other developed economies in the world, as Mark has already mentioned. We have seen the amount of foreign investment in our New Zealand equities market grow substantially in the last eight to 10 years. And there's no reason why that foreign capital would leave or in fact would not continue to invest in the New Zealand market given we're in such a relatively strong position. So that's very positive for the New Zealand equity markets in the longer term. So what are the conclusions? Well, the key conclusion is that this budget removes the tail risk of mass unemployment, causing further economic pain down the road. That should ensure that businesses and consumer confidence should start to improve from here. In turn, that will enable investors to have confidence to invest in the New Zealand economy and in our businesses. The work by the RBNZ and their quantitative easing program further bolsters that effort in shoring up investor confidence and ensuring a smooth functioning of the rates market. Ultimately though, this budget is just one piece of the puzzle and New Zealand is very well placed to get through this crisis in a relatively better shape than many countries around the world. The budget has the potential to support that, but ultimately it will be in the details of the implementation of the package to determine how successful it will be.